how do you go from a pile of linear algebra to something that can kind of sort of think like a human? If you're a software developer and you want to use AI in your apps, there's a lot to learn. Today, we're going to zoom in on what you need to know about foundation models. Specifically, we're going to focus on the training regimen. We're also going to go over what you need to know about model size and test time compute and hallucinations and sampling strategies and temperatures. So let's get started. But first, if you want to see this entire thing, then go ahead and go to my site and put in your email address and I'll send you the entire high res roadmap. So the first thing you need to understand is that you do not need any math in order to use an LLM. So just like you don't need to understand electrical engineering to write Python. Personally, I still do some math because I think it's fun, but that is completely unnecessary. It's kind of more like a hobby. Second, we're not going to talk about the model architecture that much. What you need to know is that there's transformers and uh, they train using, you know, you don't even need to know that to use a lot of it. You know, here is a little diagram. I have not improved my ability to put LLMs into my applications by using this. And once again, it's kind of fun. Plus, if you, uh, you, know, you may have a better idea of what you want to use if you're on the bleeding edge. But unless you're doing research, then this isn't really a requirement. You just need to know about how the outputs act. Just like to use Postgres, you don't need to know about database internals. But it is a little more useful than knowing electrical engineering. But the basics is transformers. We've been using these since 2017, and they still haven't really been beaten partially because we keep on getting more efficient variations on them. H3 and Mamba are some of the more famous ones, but nothing's beaten it yet. Although very recently, since this book was published, a diffusion based LLM is uh, making waves. And, you know, I don't know uh, how well it actually does in practice, but in their tests, it can generate things 10 times as fast as a transformer based architecture. So that's the number you as a software engineer need to know about 10 times faster. That seems good. Whether you can believe it or not, whether it'll actually be useful for you, you don't actually need to know the math or the architecture in order to understand that. You just need to know some of the uh, evaluation techniques that we'll be going over in the next couple videos. But that's not this video. This video is all about the training regimen that turns it into something that you can understand. So this is a famous way of illustrating this. And we'll go back over this once we've talked about each of these stages. So you've got this monster here, unsupervised learning, supervised fine tuning, puts a little human face on it, and RLHF gives you a little smiley a friendly face to all of this linear algebra back here. And so what do each of those mean? So the pre-training. So this is how the LLMs gain the next word prediction. So they consume a massive amount of documents and they understand the statistical likelihood of various sequences. And so this is how, if you use one of these, it'll just do the next word and the next word and the next word and the next word. And, uh, We'll go over uh, the differences between this and what you see in just a second when we go over post-training. But first, about this pre-training. So the training set is all these documents that the uh, LLM looks at when it's training. And so the more something is in the training set, the better it will do on those tasks after it's trained. So language is an obvious one. So there's a ton of English in the training set and common crawl is one of the most common training sets and it's internet data and let's go ahead and go look at it so this is they crawl over the entire internet and here are 82 terabytes of compressed data and 
just getting the index files for this is 200 uh, gigabytes. So that's an insane amount of data. And yeah, so it trains over all of that. And 45.88% of that was in English. So it's going to be better at English in, than in other languages, even if it's something like doing math or programming. If the variable names are in English, it'll do slightly better. And uh, so this data set is growing. 10 years ago, it was 25 terabytes. Now it's 82. And they also uh, bring in other data sets. So if you're training your own, so then you'll want a bunch of domain-specific data. So uh, AlphaFold is an example of this. They trained it to solve the protein folding problem. And so internet data is not going to be super useful for that. So they had a bunch of protein sequences and uh, the 3D architectures and some other data. It's been a while since I've studied uh, genetics. But they put in all that data and then they are able to predict how a protein is going to fold pretty well. But you can't do that with internet data. But internet data is good for a lot of text-based tasks which is why the foundation models trained by OpenAI, Anthropic, XAI, etc., are able to be used in a ton of different situations. And you can just call out to their APIs and get something pretty good for your use case, assuming your use case has to do with text and speaking like a human. All right, so uh, post-training is what happens after you know, you've created all these, uh, they call them weights, and then that creates a giant mass of linear algebra that, you know, kind of looks like this, where it has a shape, but it's not really a human shape, and we're trying to make it human shaped. And so one of the things we do is called behavior cloning. So we try to tell it how to accomplish various tasks that humans like to do. So if you say how to make a pizza to something that has not had post-training, then it'll just complete the next word. So what we want is a recipe of making a pizza, but it might say how to make a pizza with pepperoni, question mark. And that is, we don't want it to complete that sentence. We want it to answer our question. Or actually, to be a little more technical, we want it to have a generation. We want it to generate a pizza recipe. So this is what the first round of post-training does. Here is a set of prompts that was used for InstructGPT, which is a early version of ChatGPT. And you can see that it's teaching the model how to generate content how to do a Q&A, how to do brainstorming, how to do a chat, how to rewrite things, summarize, classify, and extract data. And I don't know what the mix is for newer versions of this, but if you want it to be able to do a task, then especially for the older, smaller models, and we'll look into model size later, then you want it to have data specifically about how to complete that task. So that's what behavior cloning does. And really what is happening is we're feeding it a smaller amount of high quality demonstration data. And so this is, so we have a ton of low quality internet data. Then we have a smaller amount of high quality demonstration data that is harder to generate, but it trains it to react more like a human except if you want it to react like a computer. So for example, JSON is something that you often want your LLM to output, especially if you're using it as part of a workflow. And so you can train it to be able to generate JSON and other formats that are readable by a computer. And that is also done with supervised fine tuning. And if you have an uncommon data type, you can actually do your own fine tuning to be able to output that particular data type more accurately. And uh, this is not super uh, 
keeping with the theme of this video, but it's important for you as a programmer, you can do post-processing to fix errors. So like if it's missing an ending bracket a lot of the time, you can just be like, all right, is it miss does it have an ending bracket at the end? No, add it. So you can make up for some of the shortcomings of the LLM. Or you can just keep on generating the output until one meets the criteria. And that's expensive, but something you can do. Anyways, back to how it is trained. So we take this demonstration data, which by the way, it's, you know, it has a prompt and then an expected answer. And that expected answer is teaching it how to answer prompts of that type. Okay, so the second part of post-training, the supervised fine-tuning, the first part of post-training, puts a human-ish face on it, and then it puts a smiley face on it, the RLHF. You've probably heard that. It's reinforcement learning from human feedback, also known as preference fine-tuning. So the reason it's called preference fine-tuning is because it's encoding human preferences into the model. And so they send output from the LLM, send it to a human, and the human can either rate it or they can send multiple outputs and then the human chooses which one they prefer. And so that it's getting the human preferences and using reinforcement learning, which is a technical machine learning technique. And then through this reinforcement learning, it will start to generate more of the prompts that humans like and less that humans don't like. And this is good because it can make it easier to talk to. It will also uh, make it less mean, less judgmental, less biased, less eager to engage in criminal activity. There's a lot of things that you can train into this model based on what you choose to have it uh, output. And a lot of the things they do are to make it less likely to get the model creator in trouble, which is you know very important in a legal system. It does sometimes lead it to over-censor or introduce bias in other directions because everyone has a bias and lots of these are made in San Francisco, and, but not everyone understands their bias. And there is some evidence that this whole process, besides making it easier and nicer to talk to, also makes it a little bit dumber. For most people, and especially for most corporations, trading off a tiny bit of intelligence for making it less offensive and easier to talk to is way worth the trade-off. But for your own personal models, you may think differently. Speaking of results you don't want, hallucinations. So these happen because what we've trained it to do is not produce the correct answer. What we've trained to do is first produce the statistically most likely next word, and then we've trained it to format it in a certain type of answer. Then we've trained it to give the answer that humans prefer. And a lot of times that does end up being the correct answer more than it was before, but the overlap there is not 100%. And so this is especially true if you know, you have something where the people doing the training, the people doing the RLHF, have no idea what the right answer is. And so if you have, you know, advanced uh, physics knowledge, you're trying to ask a question about that. Your, you know, worker who is trying to do the RLHF preference training, then how are they supposed to know? They're going to do the one that looks right, which is not always the same thing as being right. Also, if you introduce an error early into the chat, then you can get the LLM to produce an alternate universe of facts based on that error. And in that case, you know, it's your fault, but it'll just affirm you and create uh, stuff building off of that. All right, so that is how it's trained. But there are other things that you need to know when using these. So when you're in the chat, you don't use this, but when you're using the API, sometimes you'll be able to set the temperature depending on the API. And so temperature zero, it always picks the most likely option. So if the model says, okay, this is going 60%, it's going to be this word, then they're going to choose that 100% of the time if the temperature is zero. With the higher temperatures, usually maxing out at one or sometimes two, 
then the other words have a chance of being chosen as well. So, you know, the one with 60% likelihood, you know, with a high temperature, maybe it's chosen 60% of the time, maybe it's chosen 80% of the time. And uh, that gets you a little bit more variety and creativity. And you'll also want to know about test time compute. And so since this book was released, this has gotten way more important. And so in the book, what they talk about mostly is generating multiple responses and then choosing the best one. And that can improve quality. However, reasoning models have gotten really popular recently for good reason, because they're super powerful. And OpenEyes A01, DeepSeek's R1, XAI's Grok3 Thinking, Anthropic's Cloud 3.7, those all use test time compute. And they have a thinking mode where, you know, it generates a bunch of token, just like you thinking in your head. And then after it has a plan for the response, it'll create the response. So it's not just sending out the first Nix token. It'll have a little bit of time to process. And for the ones that let you see what the thinking is, it's really interesting because it will sometimes say something and then like, wait, that's not right. And backtrack and follow a different line of thought. Following on from that is the idea of compute optimal. So basically for given a certain amount of money, what are the best results you can get? And we're not gonna go into the details of this because there is, you can talk about it for training. What's the best model you can train for a certain amount of money? You can also go into inference and that gets into test time compute and so what are the best results you can get given these sets of available models and the amount of money you have? And they can also be combined with the training amortized over the amount of usage in inference. So there's a ton that you can go into there. So we're gonna call it out of scope for this video. And then we wanna talk about model size. So generally a larger model is more accurate and a smaller model is faster and cheaper to run. However, as the generations progress, then a new generation of the same size model is going to be more accurate and faster. And a lot of times the new small models can beat the old large models. And so you can see so MMLU is a way of testing how good an LLM is and to get a minimum score of 42 on it. So back three years ago, it cost $60. Last year it cost, you know, I'm not entirely sure uh, what the line spacing means, but it is less than 10 cents and which is amazing. That's a huge drop off in price. And the reason they can do that is because the newer models are faster. And then you can see in 2023, we got the first one that could have an MMLU score of over 83. And since that time, well, even just in the year that's being tracked here, then it's dropped from $45 to a uh, less than $1. And that is amazing, amazingly fast drop off in cost. And with a drop off in cost usually comes with a drop off in, well, an increase in speed, a drop off in the time required per token. So anyways, that is foundation models. I hope you will join me next time when we talk about the evaluation methodology and how we can start judging these LLMs and determine their quality. In the meantime, if you want this entire roadmap and you want updates whenever I make changes, go ahead and go to my website and put in your email.